Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this timely conversation on responding to the next disaster, building health and climate resilience in the Americas. I'm Jason Mars, I'm the director of the Adrian Arts Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. I'm pleased to be doing this event in partnership with the United States Department of State. In June, in Los Angeles, the United States will host the Summit of the Americas for the first time since 1994. This summit is the only hemispheric meeting of leaders from the, all countries across the Americas uh, democratically elected, and it's a top priority for President Biden in the region. The upcoming nine summit is a critical opportunity to reflect on previous commitments and progress, re-examine priorities in response to emerging challenges, and also to renew the very importance of hemispheric collaboration. Last September, as I mentioned, we launched a partnership with the State Department to, to support this historic event. In the lead up to the summit, we're hosting a series of policy-oriented public discussions on summit themes, democracy and governance, health and climate, resilience, green and equitable growth, and digitalization. These public discussions aim to generate consensus on top priorities, amplify diverse perspectives, and also produce tangible recommendations to take to the summit as productive and make it as productive and inclusive as possible. This is a significant endeavor. In order to achieve it, we immediately recognized the importance of working closely with our existing networks in the region, but also forging new partnerships with communities we haven't connected with in the past. Today, we turn our focus to the task of building health and climate resilience in the face of an ongoing pandemic and increasing natural disasters. The questions and conversations you will hear have emerged from sustained engagement with our partners across the Americas through individual consultations and through strategy sessions. We're also excited to include two young leaders at this event who will be posing questions to our panelists. They were the winners of an open competition organized by the Young America Business Trust, a nonprofit partner that works closely with the Organization of American States. Following open com opening comments from Pan American Health Organization Director Carissa Etienne, we have, we have a conversation on health resilience, including the participation of Ecuador's health minister, Jimena Garcon. Following that, we will turn our focus to climate resilience with a conversation including the former Secretary of Climate Change of Argentina, Rodrigo Rodriguez, and also Peter Natalio, the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator at the Latin American Bureau of USAID. Our moderators from Bloomberg Television will introduce the full panels later. The topic of climate resilience and health in the Americas is particularly central to the work of our center. Our founder, Adrian Arst, who we hear from in a moment, has a long-standing commitment and passion to resilience and regional recovery, having established both the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center and also the Adrian Arst Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. Before I give the floor to Adrian, I also want to share how we are making this particular event as inclusive as possible. For audio interpretation in English, Spanish, or Portuguese, viewers can click on the globe icon on the lower right of your Zoom screen and then select the relevant language. Also for simultaneous closed captioning, you can click on the links that our team is dropping into the chat. Thank you for joining us. And now over to our founder, Adrian Arst. Thank you, Jason, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today. As Jason mentioned, this is the second event as part of our important partnership with the US Department of State. Since September, the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center has led a campaign to generate greater momentum, awareness, and inclusivity on the road to the summit of the Americas. And just last week, the White House announced that the road will be leading us to Los Angeles. The ninth sub summit of the Americas is now <clears throat> just over four months away. And so this event comes at a critical moment for the hemisphere. Today's discussion will focus on two topics that are of great personal importance to me, climate resilience and economic prosperity across the Americas. The dual threat of climate change and COVID reveal the need for more collaborative hemispheric responses. The Western hemisphere is particularly vulnerable. The region of Latin America and the Caribbean is the second most disease prone area in the world. And the Americas alone experienced nearly 50% of worldwide COVID deaths. The first region being the Asia Pacific one. 
Today's discussion will generate actionable ideas for building a stronger hemispheric response that better prepares the entire region for the next disaster. To kick off the discussion, we will hear from Dr. Carissa Etienne, the director of PAHO, and that she is the regional director of the Americas of the World Health Organization. Since Dr. Etienne is attending the 150th session of the executive board of the World Health Organization, she has kindly recorded her remarks. After these remarks, Diego will start the first panel. Esteemed and distinguished ministers and vice ministers for health, representatives from ministries of the environment, disaster management, and international development agencies, friends and colleagues. Let me begin by wishing you a happy new year. I regret not being able to be with you in person for this important meeting. But let me also acknowledge and congratulate the Atlantic Council and specifically the Adrienne Ash Latin America Center and Adrienne Ash Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center for your foresight in organizing this consultation. As we begin 2022, we look back with serenity on the past two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has devastated this region. It has cost the lives of 2.4 million people and impacted every single one of us, particularly the most vulnerable in our societies. It has wreaked havoc with our health systems and workforce and continues to disrupt the democratic and social order, education and social protection platforms, trade, commerce, and the economy. The cost of this pandemic in fiscal terms and in terms of the political economy has distracted the region and the world in general from addressing profound structural issues that impact our very future, including the current climate crisis. It is within this context that I take this opportunity to highlight three important lessons that we must take from this pandemic. Firstly, our health and well-being are inherently interdependent on our actions on the environment, the social determinants of health, including health systems, and the economy. As such, ensuring resilient health systems and societies requires us to act with urgency across all sectors with a One Health approach and with the highest level of political commitment from countries. Secondly, resiliency in society can only be achieved if we invest in resilient health systems. Resilient health systems are built in non-pandemic times with political commitment and the necessary financing to transform health systems for the achievement of universal access to health and universal health coverage. Resilient health systems are inclusive, expansive, and comprehensive, built on the foundation of primary health care, guaranteeing the essential public health functions. They are interlinked with efficient and effective social and financial protection mechanisms to protect the most vulnerable from multi-hazard emergencies, including those caused by climate change and the consequential migration. And they are supported by scientific, technological, and industrial health complexes that promote research and development and the production of quality, safe, and affordable vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And finally, regional solidarity and action is critical in pandemic response and in recuperation and recovery phases of a pandemic. Whether it is coordinated action in health surveillance, the implementation of the IHR, simplification of supply chains, vaccine sharing and production, or in search capacity of health systems, a one region approach in the Americas will improve pandemic response and preparedness and accelerate recuperation and recovery. The Pan-American Health Organization, at its governing bodies meeting late 2021, adopted regional frameworks 
on One Health, universal health, and resilient health systems for um, pandemic preparedness and response. The implementation of these frameworks in the Americas is imperative if we are to increase our capacity for preparedness and response in the face of future public health emergencies, to recuperate and improve health outcomes, and to build health and climate resilience within our societies. We have a roadmap forward into what I believe will be a better future for this region. And we are inviting our heads of state, ministries of health, the environment, labor, and the economy to move quickly and to act jointly as one region with the private sector, academia, and civil society in this regard. And so as we begin 2022, we do so with renewed vigor and hope. Our vision must be translated into political action with the firm commitment of countries acting in solidarity through regional fora, such as the Summit of the Americas. The Pan American Health Organization remains committed to supporting all countries in these actions and in supporting the region as a whole in its quest for health, equity, and resilience. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation. My name is Diego Area, and I am the Deputy Director for Strategic Development at the Asian Ash Latin America Center. I want to first thank Dr. Clarissa Tien for her very informative keynote remarks. Her ideas are perfect, uh, a perfect way to kick off today's conversation. So at this critical moment for our hemisphere, with global challenges testing our capabilities, the Summit of the Americas is a critical space to re-energize cooperation but also to find concrete solutions across the political spectrum that can alleviate the impact of the most vulnerable. That is why we're committed to continue including more diverse voices in these discussions and elevating the critical importance for the future of our region of a successful ninth summit of the Americas. So now, what are the opportunities for emissary collaboration around these challenges? How can the summit of the Americas serve as a platform to address them? How can the region be, be better prepared for the next disaster? To address these questions and more, I would like to introduce the moderator of our first panel focused on the future of, of health. Her name is Carolina Millan, and she is the Buenos Aires Bureau Chief for Bloomberg News. Carolina, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Diego. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for organizing today's sessions. For our first panel on health resilience, I'm honored to introduce our stellar panel, including Minister Jimena Garzón, Ecuador's Minister of Health, Patricia Wu, Chair of Health Working Group at the America's Business Dialogue, and Vice President and Managing Director of CNM International, and Miguel Eduardo Marrero Medina, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Program Manager at Americas. We will be holding this panel in Spanish and in English. So to begin, the world has fought against the COVID-19 pandemic for two years and still faces ongoing global coordination challenges. We've seen the high costs of a fragmented international response, including unequal access to vaccines and therapies, the spread of new variants and conflicts over international vaccination requirements. We'll begin with Ecuador's minister, Ministra Garzón. ¿Cómo evalúa la coordinación regional entre los ministerios de salud de América Latina y el Caribe? ¿Y cómo se podría fortalecer ese vínculo para promover la recuperación en el corto plazo y mejorar la capacidad de respuesta ante futuras pandemias? Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias primero por la invitación. Quiero dar un cordial saludo a todos eh, los presentes. Y bueno, eh, la experiencia que nosotros hemos tenido en el Ecuador eh, en el plan de vacunación que nos ha permitido vacunar por la invitación, quiero dar un cordial saludo a todos eh, los presentes y bueno, eh, la experiencia que nosotros hemos tenido en el Ecuador eh, en el plan de vacunación que nos ha permitido vacunar a 9 millones de personas en apenas 93 días, eh, pues ha sido, eh, digamos que la única manera para eh, poder llegar a alcanzar este objetivo fue juntar todos los esfuerzos. Todas las, las, las empresas públicas, privadas, las Fuerzas Armadas, eh, eh, la Cruz Roja, 
juntamos esfuerzos para alcanzar un mismo objetivo que fue vacunar a todos los ecuatorianos en el menor tiempo posible. Esto nos, nos ha enseñado, por supuesto, que cuando eh, se juntan esfuerzos, en este caso de Latinoamérica y del Caribe, eh, enfocados a una misma dirección, a un mismo objetivo, pues se, se logran grandes cosas. Eh, en la actualidad nosotros del Ecuador tenemos más del 87% de la población vacunada eh, con una dosis, tenemos más del 82% de la población vacunada con dos dosis, se han colocado eh, dosis de refuerzo, tercera dosis, al 14% de la población y estamos eh, pues enfocados en vacunar a niños de 3 y 4 años y quizás menores en los próximos meses. Este plan de vacunación que ha sido tan, eh, tan exitoso y nos, en, nos, nos ha dado tantas grandes experiencias significó un movimiento social, el, más movimi el, el movimiento logístico más grande de la historia reciente del país. Eh, participaron, como les digo, la empresa pública, privada, las fuerzas armadas, las universidades, eh, eh, las organizaciones internacionales, eh, instancias del gobierno, eh, que han sido lo que nos ha permitido llegar a esos grandes logros. Eh, nosotros estamos seguros que el momento que eh, las instituciones a nivel internacional, nosotros como gobiernos, eh, dejando agendas particulares sin sesgos políticos o sin sesgos eh, eh, ideológicos, eh, pues nos podamos sumar a una campaña para responder en forma adecuada a cualquier epidemia que existe, al, a cualquier crisis sanitaria, pues definitivamente vamos a volver eh, a convertirnos no solamente como Ecuador, sino como región en un referente mundial. Eh, el COVID-19 es, es un reto que definitivamente eh, trasciende las fronteras y hay que hacerlo cuando estamos implementando pues, medidas de salud pública para poder eh, contenerlo y combatirlo. Hay que hacerlo de manera eficiente. Es por eso que nosotros consideramos que la, la cooperación, el trabajo conjunto la comunicación entre los países, entre los ministerios de salud, entre los gobiernos, es extremadamente importante. El plantear medidas preventivas en conjunto es importante. Eh, el poder colaborar, por ejemplo, con pruebas diagnósticas, eh, el poder igual colaborar con las experiencias que hemos tenido en nuestros planes de vacunación y de contención eh, de la pandemia, contención epidemiológica de la pandemia, nos va a ayudar a poder determinar ¿Cuáles son los, plazos, los pasos que se tienen que implementar de aquí en adelante para poder prevenir y no solamente pues, remediar, que es lo que eh, en, en la mayoría de casos hemos tenido que hacer, al, al menos al inicio de esta, de esta pandemia? Eh, el mundo no estaba preparado para una crisis como la que hemos sufrido, pero definitivamente luego de esta experiencia de más de dos años, eh, al sentarnos a conversar acerca de cómo hemos manejado la pandemia en nuestro país, en nuestros países, eh, cómo eh, diseñamos los planes de vacunación, cuáles son las medidas que hemos implementado con la ayuda de todos los sectores dentro de nuestros países, por supuesto que nos va a permitir a determinar medidas en las que podemos colaborar para que el impacto, si es que existe una próxima pandemia, no sea como el que nos dejó la COVID-19, no solamente en pérdidas humanas, el impacto social y económico ha sido extremadamente grande y no queremos vol volver a sufrir algo de, esta, de estas dimensiones. Gracias, Entonces, así como nosotros consideramos que es importante la colaboración definitivamente en todas las áreas. Muchas gracias. My next question is for Ms. Patricia Wu. We know that enhancing health resilience across the Western Hemisphere requires functioning health systems, regulatory convergence, stable supply chains, and above all, a robust health and economic sector. So what role does the public, private sector play in bolstering these regional efforts? Thank you, Carolina, for that. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Minister, for your remarks. You know, I think, um, Carolina, the private sector plays an absolutely crucial role. As we've seen with this pandemic, it's uh, the private sector that has, as you mentioned, provided a stable supply Um, in terms of the medicines and the technologies that we need. But I think as we look to the summit, 
what is the role the private sector can play in this space? I think we all recognize, as the minister said, we need to be more resilient. And to do so, the private sector can really bring the insights and the knowledge as to how our region can um, make sure that more of that manufacturing happens here. And more of that manufacturing happening here means our re region can be more resilient. But to do that, we really need to do the hard work of attracting and sustaining global health investments in this region. And the private sector understands what those enabling factors are. Just as an example, with respect to manufacturing, the private sector understands that when it comes to technology transfer for commercializing and transferring research, how that can be done in a way that again, sustainably attracts um, private sector investment here. Market and commercial incentives for R&D and for pricing and reimbursement for medical products. These are issues where the private sector, of course, I think has key perspectives. Digital health. I think digital health has been a true hero in this pandemic. One of the statistics we've seen is that in Brazil, for example, 70%, 70 excuse me, of people who intended to go to the emergency room had their problems resolved virtually. It is the private sector that is providing these digital solutions but it is also the private sector that appreciates the legal and regulatory barriers and models that are needed in order for us to deploy more of these types of digital health solutions so that we can make health more accessible, more affordable, reach more vulnerable communities. Um, so Carolina, I think private sector is gonna be critical to creating this resilience. Um, and, and ultimately, if the private sector does not have the solution outright, and the private sector has the insights into the problem and the barriers, as well as the resources and the expertise to, as the minister said, collaborate and partner to get us to become a much more resilient, inclusive, sustainable region. Um, so we're better prepared for the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Marrero Medina, we've seen that trusted community organizations can bridge access from government resources to marginalized communities. So what steps can governments take to better work with civil society to support these efforts? First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity of being participating here in this panel. So thank you, thank you so much on behalf of my peers and, and, and from myself. Um, this is an excellent question. And I think that I should begin answering uh, this question with, with an example. I want to share the collaboration here in Puerto Rico in mental health and psychosocial support between my organization. I work for AmeriCares, it's an NGO that I've been working in the humanitarian uh, area for more than, than, 40, uh, than 40 years. And the administration of mental health and anti-addiction services of Puerto Rico, known by its acronym uh, as AMSCA. Um, during two historical moments that we uh, that, that were uh, the earthquake in 2020 in Puerto Rico and therefore during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, since 2020 to the present, in this collaboration we achieved, we achieved uh, something extremely important. This agency that is the Islands and Governmental Mental Health Authority has a large load of services and responsibilities throughout the island. Uh, they trusted us as experts in the field of mental health to support uh, or to train uh, mental and behavioral health professionals, social psychologists, social workers, and, and counselors in areas related to management of, of, of mental health in the context of emergencies and disaster. They uh, relied on, on AmeriCare's experience and expertise to give tools to their teams. Like this one, I can talk also about the experience helping other peer NGOs and the government across the region. For example, the response to Venezuela migrant crisis in Arauquita, Colombia, or the work in support of training psychology in psychological first aid and crisis intervention uh, in that phase of the pandemic to the authorities of the MINSA, the Ministry of Health in El Salvador. In summary, I want to echo the words that uh, before were mentioned by Minister Garzon, where she said that cooperation, teamwork, and, and communication are an important part of, of, of this process, as, as even uh, Dr. Wu mentioned before, using maybe technology, using all the resources that, that, that we have to, to support 
uh, the the collaboration, the communication. So the collaboration of, of, of the states with the NGOs and vice versa is a necessary tool to adopt new forms of, of decentralization that promote the best use of resources. For the purpose of my work scenario is mental health and psychosocial support. This is clearly reflected in the basic principles promoted by the IASC, where it is established as two of those core principles take advantage of local available resources and capabilities, and also to develop integrated support systems. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question will be for both Minister Garzón and Dr. Marrero Medina. So I'll begin in Spanish. Muchos determinantes de salud ponen a las comunidades vulnerables y de escasos recursos en mayor riesgo a pandem en, en pandemias y en emergencias sanitarias. ¿Qué pasos son necesarios para mejorar la equidad en la salud y para garantizar que las futuras políticas regionales tomen en cuenta temas como el género, clase y raza? Ministra Garzón. Gracias, gracias, gracias Carolina. Bueno, es importante que, que partamos de procesos participativos e inclusivos, donde la política pública sea siempre trabajada por los diferentes actores sociales. Eh, un ejemplo de eso eh, se está dando a cabo aquí en, en nuestro país, en el Ecuador, en, en el cual estamos desarrollando nuestro plan decenal de salud 2022-2031. En este plan decenal, pues hemos convocado a la academia, a los gremios de salud, a los representantes de los organismos de, internacionales. De hecho, estamos eh, trabajando este plan de salud de la mano con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud. Eh, hemos considerado la participación, por supuesto, de los, de los eh, representantes de los pueblos y nacionalidades eh, eh, indígenas, afroecuatorianos, afro para poder construir políticas públicas eh, de salud inclusivas y equitativas, eh, considerando eh, pues, la realidad de cada uno de los sectores sociales y económicos de nuestro país, sin tener en cuenta género y tampoco pues, eh, creencias. Eh, hay que replicar estas experiencias como la que nosotros estamos eh, llevando a cabo al momento. Eh, es una alternativa eh, pues, a la verticalidad que usualmente se mantiene en los estados y en los gobiernos al aplicar políticas públicas eh, que muchas veces eh, pues, no son consideradas, eh, pues, son consideradas en general y no en lo particular. Eh, nosotros como salubristas hemos eh, pues, tenido eh, formación para que las... Eh, Intervenciones que diseñamos sean a medida de las, de las etnias, de las poblaciones, para, para realmente poder tener un impacto. En el momento que uno hace, eh, diseña intervenciones eh, con molde, eh, que creemos que son aplicables a todos, pues esas intervenciones en salud pública definitivamente no son exitosas. Eh, es, es fundamental además... Eh, que podamos trabajar a, a nivel mundial para que el manejo, por ejemplo, en, en, en el caso de esta pandemia, pueda ser equitativo, pueda ser solidario, además, por ejemplo, en el acceso de las vacunas, en el acceso a las pruebas de, de, de diagnóstico, de terminación temprana, para que puedan, podamos diseñar intervenciones que sean eficaces, que sean eficaces eh, y sobre todo solidarias, a los países sobre todo de, de escasos y medianos recursos. Eh, las, las medidas extremas como en el, el confinamiento, ¿qué es lo que produce? Producen retrocesos en el desarrollo económico de los países. Eh, y pues eh, lo que hacemos al cerrar fronteras, al encerrar a, a, a las personas, es profundizar problemas importantes como la pobreza, que sabemos que es uno de los determinantes sociales de la salud más, más pues más, que, que más inciden en la salud pública. Eh, por eso en el Ecuador no hemos adap, adoptado eh, esas, esas decisiones eh, tan extremas de control de la pandemia. Hemos eh, tratado de mantener la economía abierta, que eh, la, la, la ciudadanía pueda salir, pueda producir, pueda seguirse educando. Eh, y bueno, te, brindando las oportunidades para que la salud pública permita que nuestro país siga adelante y pues se siga abriendo económica y socialmente. Eh, yo pienso que con, con estas medidas que se toman pensando siempre en, en, en permitir que la ciudadanía salga, se eduque, el, el, 
el, el paralizar las escuelas, sabemos que tiene un impacto extremadamente negativo, más aún en países con nuestras características eh, sociales y económicos. Entonces, el, el crear intervenciones eh, que se puedan aplicar eh, para controlar, por ejemplo, brotes locales y permitir que lo demás del país siga progresando económicamente, eh, nos permite seguir creciendo económicamente, reactivándonos y evitar que estos retrocesos económicos que se han producido por la pandemia y que ahora estamos viendo que se están produciendo en todo el mundo eh, y sobre todo en nuestra región, 15 años hemos retrocedido en cuestiones de pobreza. Entonces, tener estas intervenciones, estos diseños eh, de control eh, epidémico, de fomento de la salud pública focalizado eh, y orientado hacia características especiales de nuestra población, pues es fundamental, es fundamental. Y además, no solamente bajo la óptica de solamente el Ministerio de Salud Pública, sino un trabajo interministerial, intersectorial, con los gobiernos eh, locales, con los municipios, además de con el gobierno central, por, por, por supuesto, nos va a permitir seguir trabajando eh, con, en conjunto para reducción de la, de la eh, pobreza eh, y también para, otro, para mitigar otros impactos como el impacto climático y también la desigualdad de género. El, el paraguas de la salud pública es increíblemente amplio. Entonces sabemos que si nosotros trabajamos de forma eh, pues, eh, conjunta, bajo diferentes experticias con una forma de ver amplia la salud pública, podemos tener grandes impactos a nivel local y también a nivel pues de toda eh, América. Gracias. Doctor Mario Medina, we'd be interested in your insights as well, as well adding your, your thoughts on your expertise on, on building mental health resilience. Well, thank you for this question. Let me tell you something. I'm a psychologist, but I am also a public health professor. And I'm really passionate in this topic of social determinants of health, specifically of social determinants of mental health. So maybe I'm going to be like really passionate in this, <laughs> answering this, this question. But, you know, social determinants uh, have complex impact on, on health and clearly on mental health, education, social connection, context of the neighborhood where we live type of work and access to services or, or medical care, even at the built environment, they all clearly have an, an, an influence on the well-being of a person and therefore in their mental health. It, it should be noted that economic, uh, economic stability or socioeconomic status, uh, as was uh, mentioned uh, before by Ministra Garzón, Um, have a crucial is a crucial determinant related to the mental health, not only of an individual but to a community. In fact, statistically speaking, people with mental illness are twice as likely to be pure and uninsured as the general population. For this purpose, and entering fully into answering uh, your question, I believe that the way to address this is one of multiple concurrent approaches where an important and core factor is education and awareness in different spheres, I mean stakeholders, government, and community, about the importance of recognizing what the, deter the determinants are and its influence on mental health. On the other hand, raising awareness about mental health as an integral part of health will uh, avoid the stigma that often uh, serves as a barrier to certain services. We should motivate or like working with political leaders and stakeholders in the creation of inclusive policies and legislation where mental health is pri uh, pr prioritized with the participation of the communities affected. We should, for example, strive to normalize the search for help in mental health services to avoid the stigma about mental health uh, disorders. And certainly, we should aim to achieve access to quality services in mental health for all, not just for those who can afford it. I, I want to share an example. I love stories and examples, as you can see in my answers. Uh, Americares have integrated uh, psychological support and accompaniment service to different populations, such as uh, uh, in, in our outpatient clinics in Colombia for the Venezuelan migrants population in Colombia, often referred to as the walkers, los caminantes, who arrive walking from, from Venezuela, or our work in the Philippines where the staff 
alliances with government agencies to influence the public policy making by actively engaging in mental health awareness activity for officials, but also inserting themselves in the communities and educating families on topics in mental health and providing access to services. In Puerto Rico, since the earthquake, we, uh, that we talked before, we began to offer spaces of emotional stabilization to health professionals who felt burned out and were experiencing compassion fatigue, but who often do not seek for mental health. At the same time, we educate community leaders to go out in, in their communities to be able to support the, with psychological first aid, for example, for crisis interventions, and even refer cases as necessary. These are all steps that integrate awareness with education and literacy while opening access to services and naturally building awareness and resiliency. Great, thank you. Ms. Wu, you've mentioned that the Summit of the Americas could generate a platform and a mechanism to convene major actors focused on health from multilateral institutions, research centers, the private sector, and local governments. So my question for you is, what are some possible short and medium-term goals that these actors should be looking at to be ready for the next health disaster? Thank you so much, Carolina, for that question. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think too often we see that these meetings end with a statement, and unfortunately, then the work stops there. And that's why we as private sector and our civil society partners have jointly recommended that we take the opportunity with this pandemic to not do that, not do business as usual, but take this opportunity to rethink health for our region and to have our leaders in June in Los Angeles commit to creating an annual high-level public-private forum to help inform and realize uh, what a truly resilient health system, health economy looks like for our region. And by that, by that I mean, Carolina, not just the, the a narrower box of, as, as one OAS ambassador um, has characterized, just the public health system or hospitals, but the much bigger box and more complex issues that helps us to be more resilient. And by that, I mean supply chains for medicines, eliminating regulatory duplication for, for example, test kits, digital health, like I talked about earlier, financing. This takes institutionalized collaboration. This takes hard work every day, every week. This requires meeting annually. So we hold each other accountable and we make progress. This requires enlisting the support of international organizations like the Inter-American Development Bank, of course, like PAHO, but um, it can't be done alone. You really need, um, you know, I don't think health ministries can really take this on alone. If we want resilience, we need to bring in all of these stakeholders. As far as what it could accomplish, Carolina, you know, I think just a few examples. So I've talked about supply chains. You know, I think there, again, we can identify and then together put in place the policies to attract and sustain the manufacturing that I think we all would like this hemisphere to be more competitive in. So I think that's absolutely a critical area. Digital health, again, I mentioned that earlier, a hero of this pandemic, but there's so much more opportunity here. We can together identify and put in place the policies to enable more digital health solutions so that healthcare can be more accessible and affordable. And you know what, Carolina, I know we can do this because we've done it before. Here's another example. We, as a private sector, have set down with a group of countries before, and we found that we had a shared interest in reducing unnecessary regulatory duplication. Why? Because for governments, there are only there's so much only so much public health budget, and they want to keep that precious public health resources for emergencies like COVID. They don't want to be using it on unnecessary re regulatory duplication. Patients certainly don't want that because that delays their access to medicines innovation. So together we brought in with the support of academia, excuse me, academia and others, we scaled up training for regulators so that we are now training across nine countries, across 21 centers, and we are training hundreds of regulators together each year. This is private sector, regulators, academia, all working together hand in hand. Carolina, not because there was one meeting and then we all magically made it happen, but because we were asked to sit down together year in and year out and really share and dialogue what are our shared interests, what are the pain points, what can we actually get done together. 
And I think that's what we need. So I think what, you know, we'd really like to see happen is in June, as I mentioned, for leaders to commit to not just one document and then walking away, but actually having a mechanism, an institutionalized mechanism where we can all roll up our sleeves and do the hard work that I think we all know needs to be done in order to truly transform our health economies and ecosystems to better serve our citizens. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you, Ms. Wu. So we're we're running short on time, but I did want to turn the last question to Minister Garzón. So, Ministra, le pregunto para responder brevemente, así si permitimos que siga el, el evento, pero la, quería cerrar con la pregunta, ¿de qué manera pueden las instituciones multilaterales y el sector privado apoyar a los ministerios de salud en la región? Y sobre todo, ¿cómo pueden trabajar en conjunto para prevenir la corrupción en los sistemas de salud? Bueno, muchísimas gracias Carolina, esta es una pregunta extremadamente importante y me uno a las palabras de Patricia. Eh, pues definitivamente los ministerios de salud a nivel regional no podemos trabajar solos, necesitamos del apoyo de los organismos internacionales, eso es lo que nosotros hemos venido haciendo eh, con la implementación del, del Plan Fénix, que es el plan de control de la pandemia, integral de la pandemia aquí en el Ecuador. El apoyo de la Organización Panamericana de la Salud ha sido básico para nosotros para poder pues eh, con sus expertos, con el apoyo tecnológico que nos han brindado, alcanzar los logros que hemos tenido. No lo hubiéramos podido hacer solos. Definitivamente los organismos internacionales como la OPS, como la UNICEF, como el Banco Mundial, como la Organización Mundial de la Salud han sido básicos para países como nosotros, en los cuales eh, muchas veces tenemos recursos limitados para poder acceder a muchos eh, pues, beneficios de la tecnología a tener expertos suficientes como para manejar temas complicados como estos y además que tenemos problemas, por ejemplo, en abastecimientos de fármacos. Hemos tenido nosotros acercamientos a UNITAR, a UNOPS, a PNUS, por ejemplo, a la OPS para poder abastecer de, de manera adecuada de fármacos a nuestros hospitales y, y no tener que tener problemas eh, de abastecimiento como el que ha sufrido el Ecuador por varios años y sabemos que estos eh, pues problemas eh, en, en, en cuanto a abastecimiento de fármacos no solamente se producen aquí en nuestro país, se producen en otros países, también en Latinoamérica. El apoyo de los organismos internacionales en todas las áreas de la salud es extremadamente importante. Hemos dicho que el, el, el trabajo colaborativo de todos nos llevará a tener una mejor salud pública a corto, a mediano y a largo plazo. Muchas gracias. Well, next I'd like to introduce Fabiola Alfaro, a young leader from El Salvador, who is a selected winner of the Youth in Summit campaign from the Young America's Business Trust. She will ask the final question to our panelists, and we we just ask that panelists keep their answers to 30 seconds or less. Adelante, Fabiola. Muchísimas gracias, Carolina. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Es para mí un verdadero privilegio poder hacerles la siguiente pregunta, Ministra Garzón. Patricia Gu y doctor Miguel Eduardo. ¿Qué medidas deben adoptar los países de las Américas para garantizar el derecho de las mujeres a tener acceso a los servicios de salud, incluida la salud mental, de manera gratuita? Bueno, rápidamente, contesto. Eh, nosotros tenemos de, eh, la capacidad, es una, una ventaja de ser ministros de salud que podemos generar políticas. Entonces, el momento que nosotros podemos generar políticas, y por supuesto tenemos el apoyo de nuestro gobierno central, podemos garantizar el acceso de la salud a las mujeres, eh, siempre teniendo en cuenta todos los, los problemas, todas las desventajas, todas las eh, pues, complicaciones que tiene una mujer en su vida diaria y más en el acceso a la salud. El tener eh, de la mano la política pública eh, nos permitirá dar una, una ventaja en eso, a las mujeres y bueno, a todas las minorías también. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, si, eh, si quieren continúo yo, if you want I could answer. Uh, on my behalf. You know, I remember, uh, first of all, muchas gracias por la pregunta, Fabiola. I remember a few years ago, a report by Dr. Michael Marmot, a specialist in social determinant of health chair, that shared the data about that, uh, that the girl on Lebanon 
uh, born on Lesotho, South Africa, will probably live 42 years less than one born in Japan. That was around 2010. Or that the baby of an uneducated Bolivian woman who had 10% probability of dying while that uh, of a woman who had completed at least secondary education had a po just 0 0.4 probability of dying. A subsequent review 10 years later and published in 2020, uh, it, it seems that there have been few advances, uh, if any. Actually, there is a decrease in life expectancy among women in the most disadvantaged community. In this study, my, Marmot highlight uh, the point that I want to, to, to highlight here, the relevant elements of poverty, ethnicity, and inequalities in relation to the spaces where uh, they live in detecting notable increase in social inequalities and poor health outcomes of the population. Regarding the actions to tackle this, I believe that it is important to achieve legislation, as mentioned by Minister Garzón, and programs that give access to physical and mental health services, as well as access to education for women. This mo must go hand in hand with measures to contribute to equity in terms of income, employment, and services uh, for women when compared to men. On the other hand, I believe that strategies, programs, and interventions that help to eliminate super exploitation of women, where we have women working two shifts while uh, they take care of and raising up their, their children, many times without any kind of support of the system. Of the system. Uh, so that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Fabiola, a great question. I think in terms of how uh, women can better access health services, in particular mental health services, I think the private sector can again play a key role. And here's two reasons why. The first is the private sector are major employers. And I think, as we as you probably know, mental health um, is viewed by some as the largest non-communicable disease. And that inhibits the ability of women to bring their best, to come to work, and, and to show up at work. And so I think if employers can understand this and we can work with employers, there could be more programs where employers, um, given that that's a time where a, a space where women spend a lot of their time can have access to mental health services. The second, um, Fabiola, is I think private sector provides innovation and a lot of ways in which we can help get to more people, whether it's through virtual uh, mental health services or other is through innovation. And so I'm looking forward to the private sector providing more solutions to help um, get uh, women the, the support they need. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you so much so to much. Fabiola and to our distinguished panelists for sharing their insights with us today. So now we'll turn it over to Diego. Muchas gracias, Carolina, and thank you to all the panelists for such an insightful discussion. Um, and before we take a five-minute break for, from this first portion of our conversation, um, we wanted to share with everyone um, this video from an amazing U.S. civil society organization and one of our partners for this initiative, COPAL, which stands for Comunidades Organizando el Poder y la Acción Latina. Their work is really a testament about the civil society's role in protecting vulnerable communities and in strengthening regional ties. After the video, we'll take five minute break and then come back for the second panel starting at 2.55. So now we'll show the video, enjoy. Llega un punto en que una persona agota todos sus recursos y debe tomar la difícil decisión de emigrar para escapar atrocidades políticas, socioeconómicas o ambientales. Muchas comunidades de migrantes están rodeadas de manera desproporcionada por contaminantes, lo que debilita sus sistemas inmunológicos y los hace más susceptibles a enfermedades como el COVID. COPAL brinda servicios a la comunidad a través de nuestro equipo de salud y bienestar y el centro de trabajadores, pero también somos agentes de cambio. Hemos luchado por camino hacia la ciudadanía para millones de inmigrantes. Welcome back everyone. Um, in our next discussion, we'll focus on how this summit could promote a more inclusive hemispheric response to natural disasters. And to moderate this discussion, we have the amazing Sherry Ann she is a New York-based anchor at Bloomberg Television. Cheryl, the floor is yours. Diego, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, we're very excited to be here. I know that throughout the panel, you've been talking about the health and well-being of people, of human beings. 
Now we want to turn the discussion to how you can achieve that by also having, of course, the health of the environment, of the planet, right? We have seen natural disasters really wiping out years of economic growth in just a matter of days. We have seen governments stalling, not being able really to do their day-to-day -day jobs, businesses never recovering from natural disasters, and of course, worst of all, uh, lives lost from natural disasters. So the fact that now we're seeing the frequency, intensity, complexity of natural disasters really increasing, these are issues that we need to address. And we know that most countries in the Americas are either facing one or, or multiple natural disasters at a time. Cooperation and coordination in the region is now more crucial than ever. So we have an excellent panel right now to give you perspective about all of these policy issues that we need to address right now. Joining us is Rodrigo Rodriguez Thornquist, former Secretary of Climate Change in Argentina. Also Peter Nariello, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. US aid. Elizabeth Riley, Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency as well as Leslie Gutierrez Carrillo, environmental justice organizer at Comunidades Organizando el Poder y la Acción Latina. Thank you all for joining us today. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Empezamos con usted, Secretario Rodríguez Tornquist. Háblenos un poquito de qué tan importante es la cooperación regional para enfrentar esos desafíos, ¿no? De lo que pasa antes y también después de los desastres. Muchas gracias, eh, Jerry. Muchas gracias al Atlantic Council por la invitación. Un placer saludarlos. Eh, a ver, no voy a decir nada nuevo. Creo que la pandemia nos ha eh, dado algunas lecciones. Eh, ¿Me escuchan bien? ¿Me ven bien? Sí, lo okay. estamos viendo bien, ¿no? Ok. Eh, creo que el principal aprendizaje a partir de la pandemia y, y de cara a lo, que, a lo que viene es que nadie se salva solo. Eh, ningún país, ni grande ni chico, tiene los recursos suficientes, los conocimientos suficientes, las capacidades suficientes para enfrentar los escenarios de enorme incertidumbre que tenemos por delante o de certeza científica con respecto a un montón de situaciones que sabemos que van a suceder. Ya tenemos evidencia científica suficiente para saber que vendrán olas de calor, olas de frío, disrupciones eh, climáticas que van a tener impactos en muchísimos aspectos Y la pandemia nos mostró que eso que potencialmente podía suceder, porque la ciencia identificaba como algo posible, bueno, sucede. ¿no? Mm. Entonces, la diferencia es que eh, ya no podemos decir que no lo sabíamos. ¿no? Entonces, eh, ese es el primer punto. El, el segundo es que ante escenarios de tanta incertidumbre como el que estamos viviendo, lo que más nos salva es la innovación. ¿no? El pensar afuera de la caja, el encontrar nuevas formas de adaptarnos a situaciones, a realidades que son bien distintas para los cuales planificamos o fueron pensados nuestros estados. Y esto demanda mucha innovación, segundo punto. El tercer punto creo que es la solidaridad, ¿no? Eh, y no una solidaridad eh, idealista o utópica solamente, sino una solidaridad realista, ¿no? Creo que también la pandemia nos mostró que estamos en un mundo globalizado y que la disrupción eh, o la afectación de una cadena productiva o una cadena logística en una parte del mundo tiene impactos en toda la economía global, ¿no? Eh, la afectación de eh, contagiados de COVID en cierto y determinado puerto en una parte del planeta genera eh, escasez de insumos en otra parte del planeta y esto mm. ya genera impactos sociales y económicos donde tenemos que pensar a un planeta, ya no de nuevo, ¿no? como algo filosófico, sino algo muy, muy realista. Ahí es muy interesante, hay un investigador de, de MIT que, que fue el, el, el inventor del Just-in-Time, ¿no? Y él dice, bueno, ahora lo que hay que hacer es el Just-in-Case. Tenemos que empezar a planificar las cadenas logísticas Just-in-Case, porque sabemos que van a pasar estas cuestiones disruptivas. Claro. Eh, lo, lo resumiría en un mensaje que pasa el Papa Francisco, que, que dice en Laudato Si, ¿no? Dice... Eh, lo que viene es muy incierto, pero necesitamos volver a saber que nos necesitamos unos a otros, ¿no? Eh, una vez yo daba clases a movimientos populares, a movimientos sociales, y una persona, un recuperador urbano en una zona de muchas inundaciones, me decía, profe, desde que tenemos inundaciones nos volvimos a saludar con los vecinos. Mm. ¿Por qué? Porque antes, cuando estaba todo bien, nadie estaba del otro. Ahora, cuando está la inundación, bueno, el vecino es todo. 
Entonces creo que esto es una invitación a repensar los lazos regionales también, a repensarnos como hermanos y como hermanas eh, ante desafíos comunes y ver cómo nos preparamos de manera solidaria, realista, para hacer frente a lo que viene. Sí. Queremos hablar de la preparación en un ratito, pero primero, Peter, I'll go to you and ask you the same question as well. How important is regional cooperation here when it comes to dealing with the challenges around natural disasters and especially the role of governments as well? Yeah, thanks so much, Sherry, for that question. And a big thank you to the Atlantic Council and to the U.S. State Department for hosting this important event. Uh, excellent and a very timely question. At USAID, we absolutely share the premise, right? The data bears it out uh, that the frequency of natural disasters is increasing. And that calls us all to partner and to partner more closely. There's lots of data. Again, there's lots of data that bear that out in the LAC region, Latin American Caribbean region today. There are five times the number of disasters per year compared to 40 years ago. From 1980 to 2016, more than 4,000 natural disasters affected close to 300 million people, tragically killing about 290,000. Perhaps the most novel illustration at this point is that the record-breaking 2020 Atlantic hurricane season exhausted the designated 21 name list of storm names so quickly that the World Meteorological Organization changed its naming convention to eliminate the use of Greek letters and create a new system to name storms. Mm. As, at, at, so as we watch the dramatic increase in disaster events, in costs and in lives, We know at USAID that we have to double down on our decades-long focus on prevention, and we have to absolutely have to build more and stronger partnerships to respond when disasters hit. Uh, I was so gratified by that last panel because each of the three panelists USAID works closely with. We work closely with AmeriCares, we work closely with Ecuador's Ministry of Health, and we work closely with the private sector. Since the late 1980s, our Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance at USAID has implemented a long-term capacity building program in partnership with Latin American and the Caribbean countries to improve host country preparedness and response capabilities and to mitigate the effects of disasters on vulnerable communities. Right. Um, just, uh, uh, just one example of how that partnership has played mm. out recently and how we have to double down on that. Um, was USAID's recent response to the volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the summer of 2021. It's wonderful to be on this panel with Elizabeth Riley of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA. While we've never met before, our organizations have been partners for many, many years. And in fact, USAID worked with Elizabeth and her team uh, to quickly get assistance to those affected by last summer's right. volcano. So let's turn to actually Elizabeth, and, and we want to ask you about regional cooperation, right? How do organizations like yours that deal with disaster emergency management, uh, how do you view uh, broader regional collaboration? And what are some of the lessons that you can tell us about from past experiences as well? Well, thank you so much, Sherry, Ann, and I'm happy to join today's panel and also to bring a perspective from small island developing states. And the, the previous speaker, Peter, um, talked about the hazard impacts in the region. And of course, natural hazards and their impacts is one of the sources of the extreme vulnerability of our small island developing states. And we've seen it roll back progress in a number of our states, including in Dominica in 2017. Um, I also think that we, we saw the implications of the pandemic within the small island context within the last two to three years, and it's been particularly impacting on the economies of the Caribbean sits because of the heavy dependence on tourism. So you asked about ways in which regional organizations can assist in building broader hemispheric collaboration. I want to touch on two. I would say first advocacy, because it's an important part of our role to share key messages about the importance of hemispheric collaboration within the political spaces where we operate. And secondly, I think it's about creating spaces and facilitating connections. And this includes through the exchange of experiences. Sedima, for example, every two years convenes a Caribbean Conference on Comprehensive Disaster Management. And we use this opportunity to reach out to our hemispheric colleagues to share experiences within that space. So with respect to lessons, uh, just a couple of things here as well. 
Um, at the hemispheric level, we do face common hazards and therefore we can learn from each other to move towards common solutions. What we are seeing is that hazards are occurring with a high level of complexity, including mm. concurrent and compounded hazards. And uh, Peter mentioned St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and this was a case where we had a volcanic eruption. We also had simultaneously severe weather events, a dengue fever outbreak, and all within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So right. I think as we look towards the Summit of the Americas, risk-informed approaches, which take into consideration the special cons consideration of SIDS, and bolstered by a coordinated action, I think by multiple stakeholders, government, private sector, and NGOs will be absolutely essential. And mm. we really do have to treat with readiness for pandemic going forward. The challenges are numerous, aren't they? I mean, Peter was mentioning how we are run out of Greek letters while we're doing the same for the variants during the pandemic, right? I do hope that you guys actually can meet face to face at some point after having worked together for so long. But let me turn to Leslie and talk about uh, civil society, right? As Elizabeth mentioned, how can grassroots organizations both provide resources to marginalized communities, but also relay critical information to governments? How can you rely on community knowledge to achieve this as well? Thank you, Sherry, and thank you to all the other panelists for sharing your very valuable uh, insight. Uh, first, I think it's important to highlight that nonprofits are not and should not be the only connection between governments and communities. Uh, nor are they a full representation of the communities they serve. Uh, the best way to reach meaningful change will always be direct connection between government and the communities they're composed of. Uh, nonetheless, as a person that does most of my community work as an organizer through COPAL, a nonprofit focused on building community power and strengthening uh, resilience within the Latinx community, in Minnesota, I do believe nonprofits can be a helpful tool in facilitating conversations and providing resources uh, to the community. Nonprofits have historically served as hubs for community leadership development, resource sharing, political engagement and education, uh, mental health support, policy change, you name it. Mm. Uh, especially right now, nonprofits have provided critical resources to the community as we address the intersectional damages of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, uh, all while addressing cultural and language barriers as well. Um, we, have, uh, we have served as a bridge for resource dispersion and information distribution that otherwise would have been impossible with our current infrastructures. Uh, it is through this on the ground work that we know our communities much more closely than oftentimes a lot of governmental entities. Uh, and the way nonprofits should share that knowledge is not necessarily by relaying information to the government of mm -hmm. what the community's needs are, but rather facilitating conversations and fighting to ensure community voices are at the decision making table. Leslie, just give us a little bit of context from your background and what you see on the ground. How do these natural disasters, not to mention, of course, environmental degradation, affect vulnerable communities? What are the long-term societal and economic effects of this harm? Absolutely. This is a very important question. Uh, as we see the climate crisis advancing, uh, we need to pay close attention to the prolonged effects that natural disasters and environmental degradation may have specifically on frontline communities. Uh, Central America is specifically susceptible to changes in precipitation. With morning warming temperatures, water basins are shrinking, uh, leaving populations with limited to no access to drinking water. Uh, climate projection models demonstrate a 20% reduction in inflows uh, to major reservoirs in El Rio Lempa, the largest river system in Central America, and it's included in parts of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, uh, that, and that could be severely impacted by hydropower generated in the region, uh, as nearly half of all electricity generated in, for example, El Salvador has historically originated from hydropower, and most of that from El Rio Lempa. Um, the impacts of hydrological changes in Central America will negatively impact the capacity and quality of energy, water, and soil in the region, which will manifest in agricultural production, threatening food security for human populations. Right. Um, and in the past decade, we have seen a huge surge in forced migration from these regions. And as a climate change, and as climate change continues, this will only continue to worsen. And the long-term effects not only involve food and economic insecurity, but also threaten safety and create ongoing um, generational trauma. Uh, and the global north has a huge responsibility in utilizing their resources to mitigate this harm. 
So really, suffice to say that it's a really devastating impact on different levels that we can see from these issues, right? Let's talk a little bit about the preventative measures that we can take, the uh, preventative, also preparedness. Um, Secretario Rodríguez, let me turn back to you, porque estamos hablando de eso, ¿no? ¿Cómo nos podemos preparar? ¿Qué tecnología, recursos se necesitan para ayudar a los gobiernos? Uh, no solo a nivel nacional, pero también a nivel subnacional, ¿no? Para que podamos responder mejor a los desastres naturales, pero también uh, qué se necesita en los recursos monetarios, especialmente en financiamiento internacional y nacional, para que nos podamos preparar eh, en, con, en todos estos desafíos que vemos en el mundo ahorita. Uh, perdón, secretario perdón, Rodríguez, ¿está perdón, ahí todavía? Estoy, ya, ya, ya estoy, perdón. Eh, <risa> Bien. Perdón, eh, pasa siempre, no importa cuánto uno se prepare. Eh, <risa> disculpas. Eh, a ver, es, es una pregunta compleja, pero diría tres cosas, ¿no? En primer lugar, ya sabemos qué tecnologías vamos a necesitar, tecnología satelital, sistemas de monitoreo remoto, alerta temprana, eh, purificación de agua y, y, y demás. Y eso creo que nos tiene que empezar a, a, a llevar una discusión que tímidamente inició con el tema de las vacunas, que es el tema de las tecnologías o de ciertas tecnologías como bienes públicos globales. ¿no? Eh, hay ciertas tecnologías que tenemos que empezar a considerarlas ya como algo más allá de la licencia o la patente de tal o cual empresa o país, para empezar a eh, abrir estas tecnologías para que sean de simple acceso eh, justamente para poder eh, fortalecer la resiliencia de nuestros territorios. El segundo punto es que creo que si hiciésemos un análisis económico de los costos de la cooperación eh, y los impactos en términos de resiliencia y cómo eso puede permitir hacer que nuestros sistemas se fortalezcan y, y se preparen mejor para lo que viene, creo que podríamos hacer eh, como una suerte de, de, de mención a lo que fue el STEM Report, ¿no? El, el costo de la acción climática es muy eh, menor al costo de la inacción climática. Yo creo que el costo de la cooperación regional es mucho menor al costo de la no cooperación en términos de difusión regional y esto, así como antes en la primera pregunta había dicho, creo que tenemos que cooperar por una cuestión realista y solidaria, tenemos que cooperar también por una cuestión de supervivencia para prepararnos, mm. porque es más barato. Y tercero, creo que todo esto se va a poder si realmente nos damos un diálogo en esto sobre cómo repensar la arquitectura financiera internacional, ¿no? cómo cumplir con alinear flujos financieros a la resiliencia, a la adaptación, a la acción por el clima, al fortalecimiento de nuestras comunidades y premiar en términos financieros, en términos crediticios, a las acciones que contribuyen al bien y, por otro lado, cargar los costos de las externalidades negativas en aquellas inversiones que pueden ser muy rentables, pero que nos llevan a escenarios que van a ser muy complejos desde lo económico, desde lo social y de lo territorial. Dejo ahí. Muchas gracias. Gracias por esa observación. Y también, um, let's turn to Elizabeth, because I know that the Caribbean Resilient Recovery Facility has just launched last month, right? Tell, tell us a little bit about how this will improve sort of operational readiness within the Caribbean community. Thanks, Sherry Ann. So the, this facility is a regionally owned and driven mechanism, which is really intended to strengthen preparedness for recovery within the region. And we're going to be doing so through a number of avenues and with a range of partners looking at both ex ante and ex post resilient recovery services to our states. Um, this is through training, um, provided guidelines and uh, supporting tools on recovery and also bringing partners together to look at complex issues like financing for recovery. Um, on the front of the operational readiness though, the region also has what we call our regional response mechanism. And I think it's a great model that can be looked at even within the context of the broader hemisphere because we have 20 Caribbean countries coming together to pool their resources to support states that have been impacted. And I think that We come together to do exercising. Uh, we have standards, uh, surge support mechanisms. And I think it's a great model, even within the context of the Americas and at the hemispheric level, and probably discussions can be taken forward at the summit of the Americas level as the whole model, which is used in the Caribbean and has worked very successfully, could be expanded to that hemispheric level as well. Peter, uh, let me turn to you. 
what have been some of the most effective preventative measures taken at USAID? Ooh, do we have Peter at this point? <laughs> I know sorry Zoom can that. be challenging for everyone. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I missed my microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, we can yeah. hear you. <laughs> so, um, just the power. You know, so, so, absolutely agree with the premise that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right? You really want to bring in prevent. You want to bring in preventive measures up front, so that you don't have to deal with very, very costly problems later on down the road. A powerful example of that on the impact of. Uh, prevention, just following Hurricane Mitch in 1998, USAID supported the development of an end-to-end -end flood warning system in Central America, right? That was in 1998. In 2020, when hurricanes Eta and Iota hit, the system was used to effectively issue warnings of rainfall and flash flooding risks, helping to save countless lives. Eta and Iota caused an estimated 99 tragic deaths compared to 10,000 caused by Mitch 20 years earlier. So the significant decrease in loss of life can be attributed to increased national, national disaster risk management capacity, supported in part by uh, USAID's ongoing disaster risk reduction programs in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, which promote national and local capabilities. I think that's one important example of how preventative measures can really reduce the impacts of uh, natural disasters. Thank you so much for that, Peter. Um, Elizabeth just mentioned earlier some of the things that could be discussed at the Summit of the Americas. Let me turn to you, Leslie. Just super quickly, any new idea or solution that leaders should discuss at the Summit of the Americas to really create this more inclusive response to natural disasters? I'd like to see the, follow, uh, the following of uh, um, Indigenous leadership. Uh, a lot of Indigenous communities have been fighting for against climate change for centuries. And we have to look at their leadership to be able to make effective change. Mm. La misma pregunta a usted, Secretario Rodríguez Tornquist. Uh, ¿Alguna idea, nueva solución para los líderes que se tenga que discutir en el Summit de, of the Americas? De nuevo, ser muy realistas y, y hablar de financiamiento, ¿no? Bien concreto. Mm. A ver cómo transformamos esto al mundo de lo real, al mundo de lo concreto dejar de pensar solamente en cuestiones de, de donaciones y demás para empezar a, a pensar realmente en una economía de la resiliencia, ¿no? una economía de, de la transición que nos permita llegar de manera equitativa a, a hacer frente a los efectos adversos que sabemos que van a venir. Peter, 30 seconds, what do you think in terms of new ideas or solutions that you think must be discussed at the Summit of the Americas? Well, I think the summit offers just a fantastic opportunity to uh, you know, discuss the core issues facing the hemisphere. Uh, it's the only really convening event that brings everybody together uh, every three years. You know, if you just look at the watchwords, building a sustainable, resilient and equitable future, that sets the table, I think, for a really helpful and a very useful conversation. I think discussions on early warning systems, on uh, partnering with the private sector to take advantage of their technology, their innovation, their market access, I think those are absolutely critical themes that I hope will be taken up at the summit mm -hmm. uh, because I think that they give us all powerful tool tools to move forward, Sherry, with this very, very uh, uh, serious challenge that you've put your finger on in this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. And we do have the most exciting part of our conversation because we do want to bring in Dana Lisa Anza, young leader from Venezuela, selected winner of the Youth in the Summit campaign from the Young America's Business. Dana Lisa, Adelante. Gracias, Cherry. Bueno, primeramente quiero enviarles un saludo desde la tierra hermosa de Bolívar, desde la tierra del Salto Ángel. Eh, gracias por brindar este espacio a la juventud. Mi pregunta es la siguiente. Mirando hacia el futuro, ¿qué crees que se necesita para marcar un punto de inflexión en la toma de decisiones sobre las acciones climáticas para mitigar las afectaciones relacionadas a los desastres naturales? Muchas gracias. Comenzamos con usted, secretario. De nuevo, nuevamente, eh, venimos de una COP26 que nos dejó con gusto a poco por la, 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 la poca, el poco avance concreto en materia financiera, ¿no? Creo que tenemos que juntar eh, el mundo de la sostenibilidad con el mundo eh, financiero para llevarlo al mundo de la realidad. 
Mm. Uh, Peter, what do you think about looking to the future and what is needed in that inflection point in order to have a response for climate change and also mitigate uh, natural disasters? Yeah, so first, thanks to Donna Lise for being on and thanks for her, for, her, for her interest in these critical issues. It's great to see her conserving forests such as the Amazon rainforest and other critical ecosystems so that they sequester carbon is absolutely critical to get to that place where, where Donna Lisa um, points us to, helping countries and vulnerable communities to adapt and to manage the impacts of climate change is absolutely critical. Mobilizing financial resources, private sector resources to assist developing countries to reduce and or avoid greenhouse gas emissions is critical and helping communities and countries to invest in, da in, in disaster risk reduction to prevent new and reduce existing and manage remaining uh, uh, and, and, and future disaster mm. risks. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you, Peter. Elizabeth, what do you think? Uh, thanks. Well, just two things I'd like to share. Um, one is that I think there is still a need for a deeper understanding on the implications of climate change practically on us as countries, particularly with the small island developing state context, and a need to sort of bridge that gap between the science and what the practical implications are for development. And two, I think that there is a need for a, a greater elevation of the reality of some of us at the global scale because the implications for the small states are tremendous. And I think this was really very clearly articulated by uh, Prime Minister Montley of Barbados at the COP26. And I'm hoping that those messages resonate very well, including within the context of the summit. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Leslie, anything to add in terms of looking to the future and finding an inflection point when it comes to the climatic response? Thank you. Yeah, hola, Annalise, saludos. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, and I, I think it's very direct, honestly, that we really have to stop investing in fossil in the fossil fuel industry if we really want to make a change. Uh, the, the harms of it are enormous. And if we continue um, building infrastructures to um, continue investing in, in this industry, um, we won't be able to get anywhere. So. We do have a couple more minutes, so I actually want to ask about the way forward. And if you see, I would like to finish on a, on a positive note. If you see any hope of progress, where are you seeing it the most? And what are some of the models of, of progress that we could actually look towards? Um, perhaps, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts? Absolutely. I think, I think we are at a very exciting time in history. I think there are a lot of positives for us to build upon. Um, even within the context of what has come out of the pandemic, um, digital transformation and applications for disaster risk reduction, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, which I hope will be discussed within the Summit of the Americas on how we can accelerate um, the, what, the changes that we've seen with respect to digital transformation, how it's been embraced, and how we can leverage the opportunity really of the pandemic, because the pandemic has been negative, but there's also been great positives out of the pandemic that mm. I think we need to build upon as well. Y Secretario Rodríguez, la última pregunta a usted, ¿es también lo que ve la tecnología? Uh, ¿Qué tipo de progreso podemos ver de aquí? Y las oportunidades de la pandemia también, como Elizabeth habló. Eh, creo que hay, hay una discusión que se está dando en la región que es muy interesante, que es el de la canasta básica digital, ¿no? Así como, como hablábamos de, de la canasta básica alimentaria, digamos que es el mínimo umbral que tenemos que asegurarle a todos los ciudadanos y ciudadanas, hoy creo que asegurar acceso a, uh -huh. a conectividad a internet es casi tan importante para ejercer la ciudadanía como tener un documento, ¿no? Eh, y es una excelente herramienta para cualquier tipo de gestión de riesgo de desastres. Eh, los sistemas de alerta temprana, poder explicar a la gente eh, qué tiene que hacer, cómo prepararse, mantener esos sistemas vivos y funcionando en los momentos de, de crisis es fundamental y puede salvar muchísimas vidas, así que tenemos mucho para hacer en temas de expandir mm. la digitalización y acceso a conectividad. Secretario Rodrigo Rodríguez Tornquiz, muchísimas gracias por los comentarios. Thank you very much to Peter, Elizabeth, Leslie. It was really a great conversation to have with all of you. Sending it back to Diego. Gracias, Sherry. Thank you for uh, an amazing moderation. Carolina, also thank to you both from Bloomberg for facilitating today's conversation. 
and of course to all our great panelists for such an amazing discussion. Uh, to close today's event, I want to share some of the next steps uh, that will come up from today. Um, we'll work with our institutional partners, uh, some of those that have uh, spoken today and also regional allies to share the key takeaways of today's session with a focus on actionable ideas that the US government the summit secretariat, but also the national summit coordinators from across the region can leverage through their process, providing concrete recommendations for their consideration in advance of the Summit of the Americas. Also, I want to share that during the upcoming weeks, we'll continue convening key civil society actors, um, regional organizations, private sector leaders, and government officials um, to find shared solutions around the two, two key topics. The first one, a more equitable and green economic recovery post-pandemic, and also on how to promote and accelerate innovation and dig digitalization in the region. So please stay tuned for uh, more content and information throughout our social media channels. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.